History of England. Chapter 9. Part 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 9. Part 12. The general feeling was strengthened by an event which, though merely accidental, was not unnaturally ascribed to the perfidy of the King. The Bishop of Winchester announced that, in obedience to the royal commands, he designed to restore the ejected members of Magdalene College. He fixed the 21st of October for this ceremony, and on the 20th went down to Oxford. The whole university was in expectation. The expelled fellows had arrived from all parts of the kingdom, eager to take possession of their beloved home. Three hundred gentlemen on horseback escorted the visitor to his lodgings. As he passed, the bells rang, and the high street was crowded with shouting spectators. He retired to rest. The next morning a joyous crowd assembled at the gates of Magdalen. But the bishop did not make his appearance, and soon it was known that he had been roused from his bed by a royal messenger, and had been directed to repair immediately to Whitehall. This strange disappointment caused much wonder and anxiety, but in a few hours came news which, to minds disposed not without reason to think the worst, seemed completely to explain the King's change of purpose. The Dutch armament had put out to sea, and had been driven back by a storm. The disaster was exaggerated by rumour. Many ships, it was said, had been lost. Thousands of horses had perished. All thought of a design on England must be relinquished, at least for the present year. Here was a lesson for the nation. While James expected immediate invasion and rebellion, he had given orders that reparation should be made to those whom he had unlawfully despoiled. As soon as he found himself safe, these orders had been revoked. This imputation, though at that time generally believed, and though since that time repeated by writers who ought to have been well informed, was without foundation. It is certain that the mishap of the Dutch fleet could not, by any mode of communication, have been known at Westminster till some hours after the Bishop of Winchester had received the summons which called him away from Oxford. The King, however, had little right to complain of the suspicions of his people. If they sometimes, without severely examining evidence, ascribed to his dishonest policy what was really the effect of accident or inadvertence, the fault was his own. That men who are in the habit of breaking faith should be distrusted when they mean to keep it, is part of their just and natural punishment. It is remarkable that James, on this occasion, incurred one unmerited imputation solely in consequence of his eagerness to clear himself from another imputation equally unmerited. The Bishop of Winchester had been hastily summoned from Oxford to attend an extraordinary meeting of the Privy Council, or rather an assembly of notables which had been convoked at Whitehall. With the Privy Councillors were joined in this solemn sitting all the peers, spiritual and temporal, who chanced to be in or near the capital, the judges, the crown lawyers, the Lord Mayor, and the aldermen of the City of London. A hint had been given to Peter that he would do well to absent himself. In truth, few of the peers would have chosen to sit with him. Near the head of the board a chair of state was placed for the Queen Dowager, the Princess Anne had been requested to attend, but had excused herself on the plea of delicate health. James informed this great assembly that he thought it necessary to produce proofs of the birth of his son. The arts of bad men had poisoned the public mind to such an extent that very many believed the Prince of Wales to be a supposititious child. But Providence had graciously ordered things, so that scarcely any prince had come into the world in the presence of so many witnesses. Those witnesses then appeared, and gave their evidence. After all the depositions had been taken, James, with great solemnity, declared that the imputation thrown on him was utterly false, and that he would rather die a thousand deaths than wrong any of his children. 
All who were present appeared to be satisfied. The evidence was instantly published, and was allowed by judicious and impartial persons to be decisive. But the judicious are always a minority, and scarcely anybody then was impartial. The whole nation was convinced that all sincere Papists thought it a duty to perjure themselves whenever they could, by perjury, serve the interests of their Church. Men who, having been bred Protestants, had, for the sake of lucre, pretended to be converted to Popery, were, if possible, less trustworthy than sincere Papists. The depositions of all who belonged to these two classes were therefore regarded as mere nullities. Thus the weight of the testimony on which James had relied was greatly reduced. What remained was malignantly scrutinised. To every one of the few Protestant witnesses who had said anything material, some exception was taken. One was notoriously a greedy sycophant, another had not indeed yet apostatised, but was nearly related to an apostate. The people asked, as they had asked from the first, why, if all was right, the King, knowing as he knew that many doubted the reality of his wife's pregnancy, had not taken care that the birth should be more satisfactorily proved. Was there nothing suspicious in the false reckoning, in the sudden change of abode, in the absence of the Princess Anne and of the Archbishop of Canterbury? Why was no prelate of the established church in attendance? Why was not the Dutch ambassador summoned? Why, above all, were not the Hydes, loyal servants of the Crown, faithful sons of the Church, and natural guardians of the interest of their nieces, suffered to mingle with the crowd of Papists which was assembled in and near the royal bedchamber? Why, in short, was there, in the long list of assistants, not a single name which commanded public confidence and respect? The true answer to these questions was that the King's understanding was weak, that his temper was despotic, and that he had willingly seized an opportunity of manifesting his contempt for the opinion of his subjects. But the multitude, not contented with this explanation, attributed to deep-laid villainy what was really the effect of folly and perverseness. Nor was this opinion confined to the multitude. The Lady Anne, at her toilet on the morning after the council, spoke of the investigation with such scorn as emboldened the very tire-women who were dressing her to put in their jests. Some of the lords, who heard the examination and had appeared to be satisfied, were really unconvinced. Lloyd, Bishop of St. Asaph, whose piety and learning commanded general respect, continued to the end of his life to believe that a fraud had been practised. The depositions taken before the Council had not been many hours in the hands of the public when it was noised abroad that Sunderland had been dismissed from all his places. The news of his disgrace seems to have taken the politicians of the coffee-houses by surprise, but did not astonish those who had observed what was passing in the palace. Treason had not been brought home to him by legal or even by tangible evidence, but there was a strong suspicion among those who watched him closely that, through some channel or other, he was in communication with the enemies of that government in which he occupied so high a place. He, with unabashed forehead, imprecated on his own head all evil here and hereafter if he was guilty. His only fault, he protested, was that he had served the crown too well. Had he not given hostages to the royal cause? Had he not broken down every bridge by which he could, in case of a disaster, effect his retreat? Had he not gone all lengths in favour of the dispensing power, sat in the High Commission, signed the warrant for the commitment of the bishops, appeared as a witness against them, at the hazard of his life, amidst the hisses and curses of the thousands who filled Westminster Hall? Had he not given the last proof of fidelity, by renouncing his religion and publicly joining a church which the nation detested? What had he to hope from a change? What had he not to dread? These arguments, though plausible and though set off by the most insinuating address, could not remove the impression which whispers and reports arriving at once from a hundred different quarters had produced. The King became daily colder and colder. Sunderland attempted to support himself by the Queen's help, obtained an audience of Her Majesty, and was actually in her apartment when Middleton entered, and, by the King's orders, demanded the seals. That evening the fallen minister was for the last time closeted with the Prince whom he had flattered and betrayed. 
The interview was a strange one. Sunderland acted calumniated virtue to perfection. He regretted not, he said, the secretaryship of state, or the presidency of the council, if only he retained his sovereign's esteem. Do not, sir, do not make me the most unhappy gentleman in your dominions, by refusing to declare that you acquit me of disloyalty. The king hardly knew what to believe. There was no positive proof of guilt and the energy and pathos with which Sunderland lied, might have imposed on a keener understanding than that with which he had to deal. At the French embassy his profession still found credit. There he declared that he should remain a few days in London and show himself at court. He would then retire to his country seat at Althorpe, and try to repair his dilapidated fortunes by economy. If a revolution should take place, he must fly to France. His ill-requited loyalty had left him no other place of refuge. The seals which had been taken from Sunderland were delivered to Preston. The same gazette which announced this change contained the official intelligence of the disaster which had befallen the Dutch fleet. That disaster was serious, though far less serious than the King and his few adherents, misled by their wishes, were disposed to believe. On the 16th of October, according to the English reckoning, was held a solemn sitting of the States of Holland. The Prince came to bid them farewell. He thanked them for the kindness with which they had watched over him when he was left an orphan child, for the confidence which they had reposed in him during his administration, and for the assistance which they had granted to him at this momentous crisis. He entreated them to believe that he had always meant and endeavoured to promote the interest of his country. He was now quitting them, perhaps never to return. If he should fall in defence of the reformed religion and of the independence of Europe, he commended his beloved wife to their care. The grand pensionary answered in a faltering voice, and in all that grave senate there was none who could refrain from shedding tears but the iron stoicism of William never gave way, and he stood among his weeping friends, calm and austere, as if he had been about to leave them only for a short visit to his hunting-grounds at Loo. The deputies of the principal towns accompanied him to his yacht. Even the representatives of Amsterdam, so long the chief seat of opposition to his administration, joined in paying him this compliment public prayers were offered for him on that day in all the churches of the Hague. In the evening he arrived at Helvetsluis and went on board of a frigate called the Brill. His flag was immediately hoisted. It displayed the arms of Nassau, quartered with those of England. The motto, embroidered in letters three feet long, was happily chosen. The House of Orange had long used the elliptical device, I will maintain. The ellipsis was now filled up with words of high import, the liberties of England and the Protestant religion. The Prince had not been many hours on board when the wind became fair. On the 19th the armament put to sea, and traversed before a strong breeze about half the distance between the Dutch and English coasts. Then the wind changed, blew hard from the west, and swelled into a violent tempest. The ships, scattered and in great distress, regained the shore of Holland as they best might. The Brill reached Helvetsluis on the 21st. The Prince's fellow-passengers had observed with admiration that neither peril nor mortification had for one moment disturbed his composure. He now, though suffering from seasickness, refused to go on shore for he conceived that, by remaining on board, he should in the most effectual manner notify to Europe that the late misfortune had only delayed for a very short time the execution of his purpose. In two or three days the fleet reassembled. One vessel only had been cast away, not a single soldier or sailor was missing. Some horses had perished, but this loss the Prince with great expedition repaired, and, before the London Gazette had spread the news of his mishap, he was again ready to sail. His declaration preceded him only by a few hours. On the 1st of November it began to be mentioned in mysterious whispers by the politicians of London, was passed secretly from man to man, and was slipped into the boxes of the post-office. 
one of the agents was arrested, and the packets of which he was in charge were carried to Whitehall. The King read, and was greatly troubled. His first impulse was to hide the paper from all human eyes. He threw into the fire every copy which had been brought to him except one, and that one he would scarcely trust out of his own hands. The paragraph in the manifesto which disturbed him most was that in which it was said that some of the peers, spiritual and temporal, had invited the Prince of Orange to invade England. Halifax, Clarendon, and Nottingham were then in London. They were immediately summoned to the palace and interrogated. Halifax, though conscious of innocence, refused at first to make any answer. "'Your Majesty asks me,' said he, "'whether I have committed high treason. If I am suspected, let me be brought before my peers. And how can Your Majesty place any dependence on the answer of a culprit whose life is at stake? Even if I had invited His Highness over, I should without scruple plead not guilty.' The King declared that he did not at all consider Halifax as a culprit, and that he had asked the question as one gentleman asks another, who has been calumniated, whether there is the least foundation for the calumny. "'In that case,' said Halifax, "'I have no objection to aver, as a gentleman speaking to a gentleman, on my honour, which is as sacred as my oath, that I have not invited the Prince of Orange over.' Clarendon and Nottingham said the same. The King was still more anxious to ascertain the temper of the prelates. If they were hostile to him, his throne was indeed in danger. But it could not be. There was something monstrous in the supposition that any bishop of the Church of England could rebel against his sovereign. Compton was called into the royal closet, and was asked whether he believed that there was the slightest ground for the prince's assertion. The bishop was in a strait, for he himself was one of the seven who had signed the invitation, and his conscience, not a very enlightened conscience, would not suffer him, it seems, to utter a direct falsehood. "'Sir,' he said, "'I am quite confident that there is not one of my brethren who is not as guiltless as myself in this matter.' The equivocation was ingenious, but whether the difference between the sin of such an equivocation and the sin of a lie be worth any expense of ingenuity may perhaps be doubted. The King was satisfied. "'I fully acquit you all,' he said, "'but I think it necessary that you should publicly contradict the slanderous charge brought against you in the Prince's declaration.' The Bishop very naturally begged that he might be allowed to read the paper which he was required to contradict, but the King would not suffer him to look at it. On the following day appeared a proclamation threatening with the severest punishment all who should circulate, or who should even dare to read, William's manifesto. The primate and the few spiritual peers who happened to be then in London had orders to wait upon the King. Preston was in attendance with the Prince's declaration in his hand. "'My lords,' said James, "'listen to this passage. It concerns you.' Preston then read the sentence in which the spiritual peers were mentioned. The King proceeded, "'I do not believe one word of this. I am satisfied of your innocence. But I think it fit to let you know of what you are accused.' The primate, with many dutiful expressions, protested that the King did him no more than justice. "'I was born in Your Majesty's allegiance. I have repeatedly confirmed that allegiance by my oath.' I can have but one king at a time. I have not invited the prince over, and I do not believe that a single one of my brethren has done so. I am sure I have not, said Crewe of Durham. Nor I, said Cartwright of Chester. Crewe and Cartwright might well be believed, for both had sat in the ecclesiastical commission. When Compton's turn came, he parried the question with an adroitness which a Jesuit might have envied. I gave your majesty my answer yesterday. James repeated again and again that he fully acquitted them all. Nevertheless it would, in his judgment, be for his service and for their own honour that they should publicly vindicate themselves. He therefore required them to draw up a paper setting forth their abhorrence of the Prince's design. They remained silent. Their silence was supposed to imply consent, and they were suffered to withdraw. Meanwhile the fleet of William was on the German Ocean. It was on the evening of Thursday the 1st of November that he put to sea the second time. The wind blew fresh from the east. The armament during twelve hours held a course towards the northwest. The light vessels sent out by the English admiral for the purpose of obtaining intelligence brought back news which confirmed the prevailing opinion that the enemy would try to land in Yorkshire. 
All at once, on a signal from the Prince's ship, the whole fleet tacked and made sail for the British Channel. The same breeze which favoured the voyage of the invaders prevented Dartmouth from coming out of the Thames. His ships were forced to strike yards and topmasts, and two of his frigates, which had gained the open sea, were shattered by the violence of the weather and driven back into the river. End of Part 12《History of England》Chapter 9 Part 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《History of England — From the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay Chapter 9 Part 13 the Dutch fleet ran fast before the gale, and reached the Straits at about ten in the morning of Saturday the 3rd of November. William himself, in the Brill, led the way. More than six hundred vessels, with canvas spread to a favourable wind, followed in his train. The transports were in the centre. The men of war, more than fifty in number, formed an outer rampart. Herbert, with the title of Lieutenant-Admiral-General, commanded the whole fleet. His post was in the rear, and many English sailors, inflamed against popery and attracted by high pay, served under him. It was not without great difficulty that the Prince had prevailed on some Dutch officers of a high reputation to submit to the authority of a stranger. But the arrangement was eminently judicious. There was in the King's fleet much discontent and an ardent zeal for the Protestant faith, but within the memory of old mariners the Dutch and English navies had thrice, with heroic spirit and various fortune, contended for the empire of the sea. Our sailors had not forgotten the broom with which Tromp had threatened to sweep the channel, or the fire which de Ruyter had lighted in the dockyards of the Medway. Had the rival nations been once more brought face to face on the element of which both claimed the sovereignty, all other thoughts might have given place to mutual animosity. A bloody and obstinate battle might have been fought. Defeat would have been fatal to William's enterprise. Even victory would have deranged all his deeply meditated schemes of policy. He therefore wisely determined that the pursuers, if they overtook him, should be hailed in their own mother tongue, and adjured by an admiral under whom they had served and whom they esteemed, not to fight against old messmates for popish tyranny. Such an appeal might possibly avert a conflict. If a conflict took place, one English commander would be opposed to another, nor would the pride of the islanders be wounded by learning that Dartmouth had been compelled to strike to Herbert. Happily, William's precautions were not necessary. Soon after midday he passed the Straits. His fleet spread to within a league of Dover on the north and of Calais on the south. The men of war on the extreme right and left saluted both fortresses at once. The troops appeared under arms on the decks. The flourish of trumpets, the clash of cymbals, and the rolling of drums were distinctly heard at once on the English and the French shores. An innumerable company of gazers blackened the white beach of Kent. Another mighty multitude covered the coast of Picardy. Rapin de Thoiras, who, driven by persecution from his country, had taken service in the Dutch army and accompanied the prince to England, described the spectacle many years later as the most magnificent and affecting that was ever seen by human eyes. At sunset the armament was off Beachy Head. Then the lights were kindled. The sea was in a blaze for many miles, but the eyes of all the steersmen were fixed throughout the night on three huge lanterns which flamed on the stern of the Brill. Meanwhile a courier had been riding post from Dover Castle to Whitehall with news that the Dutch had passed the Straits and were steering westward. It was necessary to make an immediate change in all the military arrangements. Messengers were dispatched in every direction. Officers were roused from their beds at the dead of night. At three on the Sunday morning there was a great muster by torchlight in Hyde Park. The King had sent several regiments northward in the expectation that William would land in Yorkshire. Expresses were dispatched to recall them. 
all the forces, except those which were necessary to keep the peace of the capital, were ordered to move to the west. Salisbury was appointed as the place of the rendezvous, but, as it was thought possible that Portsmouth might be the first point of attack, three battalions of guards and a strong body of cavalry set out for that fortress. In a few hours it was known that Portsmouth was safe, and these troops received orders to change their route and hasten to Salisbury. When Sunday the 4th of November dawned, the cliffs of the Isle of Wight were full in view of the Dutch armament. That day was the anniversary both of William's birth and of his marriage. Sail was slackened during part of the morning, and divine service was performed on board of the ships. In the afternoon and through the night the fleet held on its course. Tor Bay was the place where the Prince intended to land. But the morning of Monday the 5th of November was hazy. The pilot of the Brill could not discern the sea-marks, and carried the fleet too far to the west. The danger was great. To return in the face of the wind was impossible. Plymouth was the next port, but at Plymouth a garrison had been posted under the command of Lord Bath. The landing might be opposed, and a check might produce serious consequences. There could be little doubt, moreover, that by this time the royal fleet had got out of the Thames and was hastening full sail down the Channel. Russell saw the whole extent of the peril, and exclaimed to Burnet, "'You may go to prayers, doctor. All is over.' At that moment the wind changed. A soft breeze sprang up from the south, the mist dispersed, the sun shone forth, and, under the mild light of an autumnal noon, the fleet turned back, passed round the lofty cape of Berry Head, and rowed safely in the harbour of Torbay. Since William looked on that harbour, its aspect has greatly changed. The amphitheatre which surrounds the spacious basin now exhibits everywhere the signs of prosperity and civilization. At the north-eastern extremity has sprung up a great watering-place, to which strangers are attracted from the most remote parts of our island by the Italian softness of the air, for in that climate the myrtle flourishes unsheltered, and even the winter is milder than the Northumbrian April. The inhabitants are about ten thousand in number. The newly built churches and chapels, the baths and libraries, the hotels and public gardens, the infirmary and the museum, the white streets rising terrace above terrace, the gay villas peeping from the midst of shrubberies and flower-beds, present a spectacle widely different from any that in the seventeenth century England could show. At the opposite end of the bay lies, sheltered by Berry Head, the stirring market-town of Brixham, the wealthiest seat of our fishing-trade. A pier and a haven were formed there at the beginning of the present century, and have been found insufficient for the increasing traffic. The population is about six thousand souls. The shipping amounts to more than two hundred sail. Tonnage exceeds many times the tonnage of the port of Liverpool under the kings of the House of Stuart. But Tor Bay, when the Dutch fleet cast anchor there, was known only as a haven where ships sometimes took refuge from the tempests of the Atlantic. Its quiet shores were undisturbed by the bustle either of commerce or of pleasure, and the huts of ploughmen and fishermen were thinly scattered over what is now the site of crowded marts and of luxurious pavilions. The peasantry of the coast of Devonshire remembered the name of Monmouth with affection, and held popery in detestation. They therefore crowded down to the seaside with provisions and offers of service. The disembarkation instantly commenced. Sixty boats conveyed the troops to the coast. Mackay was sent on shore first with the British regiments. The prince soon followed. He landed where the quay of Brixham now stands. The whole aspect of the place has been altered. Where we now see a port crowded with shipping, and a market-place swarming with buyers and sellers, the waves then broke on a desolate beach. But a fragment of the rock on which the deliverer stepped from his boat has been carefully preserved and is set up as an object of public veneration in the centre of that busy wharf. As soon as the prince had planted his foot on dry ground, he called for horses. Two beasts, such as the small yeomen of that time were in the habit of riding, were procured from the neighbouring village. William and Schomberg mounted and proceeded to examine the country. As soon as Burnet was on shore, he hastened to the prince. 
an amusing dialogue took place between them. Burnet poured forth his congratulations with genuine delight, and then eagerly asked what were His Highness's plans. Military men are seldom disposed to take counsel with gownsmen on military matters, and William regarded the interference of unprofessional advisers in questions relating to war with even more than disgust ordinarily felt by soldiers on such occasions. But he was at that moment in an excellent humour, and, instead of signifying his displeasure by a short and cutting reprimand, graciously extended his hand and answered his chaplain's question by another question. "'Well, doctor, what do you think of predestination now?' The reproof was so delicate that Burnet, whose perceptions were not very fine, did not perceive it. He answered with great fervour that he should never forget the signal manner in which Providence had favoured their undertaking. During the first day the troops who had gone on shore had many discomforts to endure. The earth was soaked with rain. The baggage was still on board the ships. Officers of high rank were compelled to sleep in wet clothes on the wet ground. The Prince himself had no better quarters than a hut afforded. His banner was displayed on the thatched roof, and some bedding brought from his ship was spread for him on the floor. There was some difficulty about landing the horses, and it seemed probable that this operation would occupy several days. But on the following morning the prospect cleared. The wind was gentle. The water in the bay was as even as glass. Some fishermen pointed out a place where the ships could be brought within sixty feet of the beach. This was done, and in three hours many hundreds of horses swam safely to shore. The disembarkation had hardly been effected when the wind rose again and swelled into a fierce gale from the west. The enemy, coming in pursuit down the channel, had been stopped by the same change of weather which enabled William to land. During two days the King's fleet lay on an unruffled sea, in sight of Beachy Head. At length Dartmouth was able to proceed. He passed the Isle of Wight, and one of his ships came in sight of the Dutch topmasts in Torbay. Just at this moment he was encountered by the tempest, and was compelled to take shelter in the harbour of Portsmouth. At that time James, who was not incompetent to form a judgment on a question of seamanship, declared himself perfectly satisfied that his admiral had done all that men could do, and had yielded only to the irresistible hostility of the winds and waves. At a later period the unfortunate prince began, with little reason, to suspect Dartmouth of treachery, or at least of slackness. The weather had indeed served the Protestant cause so well that some men of more piety than judgment fully believed the ordinary laws of nature to have been suspended for the preservation of the liberty and religion of England. Exactly a hundred years before, they said, the Armada, invincible by man, had been scattered by the wrath of God. Civil freedom and divine truth were again in jeopardy, and again the obedient elements had fought for the good cause. The wind had blown strong from the east while the prince wished to sail down the channel, had turned to the south when he wished to enter Torbay, had sunk to a calm during the disembarkation, and, as soon as the disembarkation was completed, had risen to a storm, and had met the pursuers in the face. Nor did men omit to remark that, by an extraordinary coincidence, the prince had reached our shores on a day on which the Church of England commemorated, by prayer and thanksgiving, the wonderful escape of the royal house and of the three estates from the blackest plot ever devised by papists. Carstairs, whose suggestions were sure to meet with attention from the Prince, recommended that, as soon as the landing had been effected, public thanks should be offered to God for the protection so conspicuously accorded to the great enterprise. This advice was taken, and with excellent effect. The troops, taught to regard themselves as favourites of heaven, were inspired with new courage, and the English people formed the most favourable opinion of a general and an army so attentive to the duties of religion. End of Part 13《History of England》Chapter 9 Part 14 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter Nine, Part Fourteen. On Tuesday, the sixth of November, William's army began to march up the country. Some regiments advanced as far as Newton Abbot. A stone set up in the midst of that little town still marks the spot where the Prince's declaration was solemnly read to the people. The movements of the troops were slow, for the rain fell in torrents, and the roads of England were then in a state which seemed frightful to persons accustomed to the excellent communications of Holland. William took up his quarters during two days at Ford, a seat of the ancient and illustrious family of Courtney, in the neighbourhood of Newton Abbot. He was magnificently lodged and feasted there, but it is remarkable that the owner of the house, though a strong Whig, did not choose to be the first to put life and fortune in peril, and cautiously abstained from doing anything which, if the King should prevail, could be treated as a crime. Exeter, in the meantime, was greatly agitated. Lamplew, the bishop, as soon as he heard that the Dutch were at Torbay, set off in terror for London. The dean fled from the deanery. The magistrates were for the king, the body of the inhabitants for the prince. Everything was in confusion when, on the morning of Thursday, the 8th of November, a body of troops, under the command of Mordaunt, appeared before the city. With Mordaunt came Burnet, to whom William had entrusted the duty of protecting the clergy of the cathedral from injury and insult. The mayor and aldermen had ordered the gates to be closed, but yielded on the first summons. The deanery was prepared for the reception of the prince. On the following day, Friday the ninth, he arrived. The magistrates had been pressed to receive him in state at the entrance of the city, but had steadfastly refused. The pomp of that day, however, could well spare them. Such a sight had never been seen in Devonshire. Many went forth half a day's journey to meet the champion of their religion. All the neighbouring villages poured forth their inhabitants. A great crowd, consisting chiefly of young peasants, brandishing their cudgels, had assembled on the top of Haldon Hill, whence the army, marching from Chudley, first described the rich valley of the Ex, and the two massive towers rising from the cloud of smoke which overhung the capital of the West. The road, all down the long descent and through the plain to the banks of the river, was lined, mile after mile, with spectators. From the west gate to the cathedral close the pressing and shouting on each side was such as reminded Londoners of the crowds on the Lord Mayor's Day. The houses were gaily decorated. Doors, windows, balconies, and roofs were thronged with gazers. An eye accustomed to the pomp of war would have found much to criticise in the spectacle. For several toilsome marches in the rain, through roads where one who travelled on foot sank at every step up to the ankles in clay, had not improved the appearance either of the men or of their accoutrements. But the people of Devonshire, altogether unused to the splendour of well-ordered camps, were overwhelmed with delight and awe. Descriptions of the martial pageant were circulated all over the kingdom. They contained much that was well fitted to gratify the vulgar appetite for the marvellous. For the Dutch army, composed of men who had been born in various climates, and had served under various standards, presented an aspect at once grotesque gorgeous and terrible to islanders who had in general a very indistinct notion of foreign countries. First rode Macclesfield, at the head of two hundred gentlemen, mostly of English blood, glittering in helmets and cuirasses, and mounted on Flemish war-horses. Each was attended by a negro, brought from the sugar plantations on the coast of Guyana. The citizens of Exeter, who had never seen so many specimens of the African race, gazed with wonder on those black faces, set off by embroidered turbans and white feathers. Then, with drawn broadswords, came a squadron of Swedish horsemen in black armour and fur cloaks. They were regarded with a strange interest, for it was rumoured that they were natives of a land where the ocean was frozen, and where the night lasted through half the year, and that they themselves had slain the huge bears whose skins they wore. Next 
surrounded by a goodly company of gentlemen and pages, was borne aloft the Prince's banner. On its broad folds the crowd which covered the roofs and filled the windows read with delight that memorable inscription, The Protestant Religion and the Liberties of England. But the acclamations redoubled when, attended by forty running footmen, the Prince himself appeared, armed on back and breast, wearing a white plume and mounted on a white charger. With how martial an air he curbed his horse! How thoughtful and commanding was the expression of his ample forehead and falcon eye may still be seen on the canvas of Knella. Once those grave features relaxed into a smile. It was when an ancient woman, perhaps one of the zealous Puritans, who, through twenty-eight years of persecution, had waited with firm faith for the consolation of Israel, perhaps the mother of some rebel who had perished in the carnage of Sedgemoor, or in the more fearful carnage of the bloody circuit, broke from the crowd, rushed through the drawn swords and coveting horses, touched the hand of the deliverer, and cried out that now she was happy. Near to the prince was one who divided with him the gaze of the multitude. That, men said, was the great Count Schomberg, the first soldier in Europe since Turenne and Conde were gone the man whose genius and valour had saved the Portuguese monarchy on the field of Montes Claros, the man who had earned a still higher glory by resigning the truncheon of a marshal of France for the sake of the true religion. It was not forgotten that the two heroes who, indissolubly united by their common Protestantism, were entering Exeter together, had twelve years before been opposed to each other under the walls of Maastricht and that the energy of the young prince had not then been found a match for the cool science of the veteran who now rode in friendship by his side. Then came a long column of the whiskered infantry of Switzerland, distinguished in all the continental wars of two centuries by pre-eminent valour and discipline, but never till that week seen on English ground and then marched a succession of bands designated, as was the fashion of that age, after their leaders. Bentinck, Soames and Ginkell, Talmarsh and Mackay. With peculiar pleasure Englishmen might look on one gallant regiment which still bore the name of the honoured and lamented Ossery. The effect of the spectacle was heightened by the recollection of the renowned events in which many of the warriors now pouring through the West Gate had borne a share, for they had seen service very different from that of the Devonshire militia, or of the camp at Hounslow. Some of them had repelled the fiery onset of the French on the field of Senef, and others had crossed swords with the infidels in the cause of Christendom on that great day when the siege of Vienna was raised. The very senses of the multitude were fooled by imagination. Newsletters conveyed to every part of the kingdom fabulous accounts of the size and strength of the invaders. It was affirmed that they were, with scarcely an exception, above six feet high, and that they wielded such huge pikes, swords, and muskets as had never before been seen in England. Nor did the wonder of the population diminish when the artillery arrived, twenty-one huge pieces of brass cannon which were with difficulty tugged along by sixteen cart-horses to each. Much curiosity was excited by a strange structure mounted on wheels. It proved to be a movable smithy, furnished with all tools and materials necessary for repairing arms and carriages. But nothing raised so much admiration as the bridge of boats which was laid with great speed on the X for the conveyance of wagons, and afterwards as speedily taken to pieces and carried away. It was made, if report said true, after a pattern contrived by the Christians who were warring against the great Turk on the Danube. The foreigners inspired as much good will as admiration. Their politic leader took care to distribute the quarters in such a manner as to cause the smallest possible inconvenience to the inhabitants of Exeter and of the neighbouring villages. The most rigid discipline was maintained. Not only were pillage and outrage effectually prevented, but the troops were required to demean themselves with civility towards all classes. 
Those who had formed their notions of an army from the conduct of Kirk and his lambs were amazed to see soldiers who never swore at a landlady, or took an egg without paying for it. In return for this moderation, the people furnished the troops with provisions in great abundance, and at reasonable prices. Much depended on the course which, at this great crisis, the clergy of the Church of England might take, and the members of the chapter of Exeter were the first who were called upon to declare their sentiments. Burnet informed the canons, now left without a head by the flight of the dean, that they could not be permitted to use the prayer for the Prince of Wales, and that a solemn service must be performed in honour of the safe arrival of the Prince. The canons did not choose to appear in their stalls, but some of the choristers and prebendaries attended. William repaired in military state to the cathedral. As he passed under the gorgeous screen, that renowned organ, scarcely surpassed by any of those which are the boast of his native Holland, gave out a peal of triumph. He mounted the bishop's seat, a stately throne rich with the carving of the fifteenth century. Burnet stood below and a crowd of warriors and nobles appeared on the right hand and on the left. The singers, robed in white, sang the Te Deum. When the chant was over, Burnet read the Prince's declaration. But as soon as the first words were uttered, prebendaries and singers crowded in all haste out of the choir. At the close, Burnet cried in a loud voice, "'God save the Prince of Orange!' and many fervent voices answered, Amen. End of Part 14「History of England」Chapter 9 Part 15 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England, from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 9, Part 15. On Sunday the 11th of November, Burnet preached before the Prince in the Cathedral and dilated on the signal mercy vouchsafed by God to the English Church and nation. At the same time a singular event happened in a humbler place of worship. Ferguson resolved to preach at the Presbyterian meeting-house. The minister and elders would not consent, but the turbulent and half-witted knave, fancying that the times of Fleetwood and Harrison were come again, forced the door, went through the congregation sword in hand, mounted the pulpit, and there poured forth a fiery invective against the king. The time for such follies had gone by, and this exhibition excited nothing but derision and disgust. While these things were passing in Devonshire, the ferment was greater in London. The prince's declaration, in spite of all precautions, was now in every man's hands. On the 6th of November, James, still uncertain on what part of the coast the invaders had landed, summoned the primate and three other bishops, Compton of London, White of Peterborough, and Spratt of Rochester, to a conference in the closet. The king listened graciously while the prelates made warm professions of loyalty, and assured them that he did not suspect them. "'But where,' said he, "'is the paper that you were to bring me?' "'Sir,' answered Sancroft, "'we brought no paper.' We are not solicitous to clear our fame to the world. It is no new thing to us to be reviled and falsely accused. Our consciences acquit us, your Majesty acquits us, and we are satisfied." "'Yes,' said the King, "'but a declaration from you is necessary to my service.' He then produced a copy of the Prince's manifesto. "'See,' he said, "'how you are mentioned here.' "'Sir,' answered one of the bishops, not one person in five hundred believes this manifesto to be genuine no cried the king fiercely then those five hundred would bring the prince of orange to cut my throat god forbid exclaimed the prelates in concert but the king's understanding never very clear was now quite bewildered one of his peculiarities was that whenever his opinion was not adopted 
he fancied that his veracity was questioned. "'This paper not genuine!' he exclaimed, turning over the leaves with his hands. "'Am I not worthy to be believed? Is my word not to be taken?' "'At all events, sir,' said one of the bishops, "'this is not an ecclesiastical matter. It lies within the sphere of the civil power. God has entrusted your Majesty with the sword, and it is not for us to invade your functions.' Then the archbishop, with that gentle and temperate malice which inflicts the deepest wounds, declared that he must be excused from setting his hand to any political document. "'I and my brethren, sir,' he said, "'have already smarted severely for meddling with affairs of state, and we shall be very cautious how we do so again. We once subscribed a petition of the most harmless kind. We presented it in the most respectful manner, and we found that we had committed a high offence. We were saved from ruin only by the merciful protection of God. And, sir, the ground then taken by your Majesty's attorney and solicitor was that, out of Parliament, we were private men, and that it was criminal presumption in private men to meddle with politics. They attacked us so fiercely that, for my part, I gave myself over for lost. "'I thank you for that, my Lord of Canterbury,' said the King. "'I should have hoped that you would not have thought yourself lost by falling into my hands.' Such a speech might have become the mouth of a merciful sovereign, but it came with a bad grace from a prince who had burned a woman alive for harbouring one of his flying enemies, from a prince around whose knees his own nephew had clung in vain agonies of supplication. The Archbishop was not to be so silenced. He resumed his story, and recounted the insults which the creatures of the court had offered to the Church of England, among which some ridicule thrown on his own style occupied a conspicuous place. The king had nothing to say but that there was no use in repeating old grievances, and that he had hoped that these things were quite forgotten. He, who never forgot the smallest injury that he had suffered, could not understand how others should remember for a few weeks the most deadly injuries that he had inflicted. At length the conversation came back to the point from which it had wandered. The king insisted on having from the bishops a paper declaring their abhorrence of the prince's enterprise. They, with many professions of the most submissive loyalty, pertinaciously refused. The prince, they said, asserted that he had been invited by temporal as well as by spiritual peers. The imputation was common. Why should not the purgation be common also? "'I see how it is,' said the king. "'Some of the temporal peers have been with you, and have persuaded you to cross me in this matter.' The bishops solemnly averred that it was not so. But it would, they said, seem strange that, on a question involving grave political and military considerations, the temporal peers should be entirely passed over, and the prelates alone should be required to take a prominent part. But this, said James, is my method. I am your king. It is for me to judge what is best. I will go my own way, and I call on you to assist me. The bishops assured him that they would assist him in their proper department, as Christian ministers with their prayers and as peers of the realm with the, their advice in his Parliament. James, who wanted neither the prayers of heretics nor the advice of Parliaments, was bitterly disappointed. After a long altercation, "'I have done,' he said. "'I will urge you no further. Since you will not help me, I must trust to myself and to my own arms.' The bishops had hardly left the royal presence when a courier arrived with the news that on the preceding day the Prince of Orange had landed in Devonshire. During the following week London was violently agitated. On Sunday, the 11th of November, a rumour was circulated that knives, gridirons, and cauldrons intended for the torturing of heretics were concealed in the monastery which had been established under the King's protection at Clerkenwell. Great multitudes assembled around the building, and were about to demolish it when a military force arrived. The crowd was dispersed, and several of the rioters were slain. An inquest sat on the bodies, and came to a decision which strongly indicated the temper of the public mind. 
the jury found that certain loyal and well-disposed persons, who had gone to put down the meetings of traitors and public enemies at a mass-house, had been wilfully murdered by the soldiers, and this strange verdict was signed by all the jurors. The ecclesiastics at Clerkenwell, naturally alarmed by these symptoms of popular feeling, were desirous to place their property in safety. They succeeded in removing most of their furniture before any report of their intentions got abroad, but at length the suspicions of the rabble were excited. The last two carts were stopped in Hoban, and all that they contained was publicly burned in the middle of the street. So great was the alarm among the Catholics that all their places of worship were closed, except those which belonged to the royal family and to foreign ambassadors. On the whole, however, things as yet looked not unfavourably for James. The invaders had been more than a week on English ground, yet no man of note had joined them. No rebellion had broken out in the north or the east. No servant of the crown appeared to have betrayed his trust. The royal army was assembling fast at Salisbury, and, though inferior in discipline to that of William, was superior in numbers. The prince was undoubtedly surprised and mortified by the slackness of those who had invited him to England. By the common people of Devonshire, indeed, he had been received with every sign of good will, but no nobleman, no gentleman of high consideration, had yet repaired to his quarters. The explanation of this singular fact is probably to be found in the circumstance that he had landed in a part of the island where he had not been expected. His friends in the north had made their arrangements for a rising, on the supposition that he would be among them with an army. His friends in the west had made no arrangements at all, and were naturally disconcerted at finding themselves suddenly called upon to take the lead in a movement so important and perilous. They had also fresh in their recollection, and indeed full in their sight, the disastrous consequences of rebellion, gibbets, heads, mangled quarters, families still in deep mourning for brave sufferers who had loved their country well but not wisely. After a warning so terrible and so recent, some hesitation was natural. It was equally natural, however, that William, who, trusting to promises from England, had put to hazard not only his own fame and fortunes, but also the prosperity and independence of his native land, should feel deeply mortified. He was, indeed, so indignant that he talked of falling back to Torbay, re-embarking his troops, returning to Holland, and leaving those who had betrayed him to the fate which they deserved. At length, on Monday, the 12th of November, a gentleman named Burrington, who resided in the neighbourhood of Crediton, joined the Prince's standard, and his example was followed by several of his neighbours. Men of higher consequence had already set out from different parts of the country for Exeter. The first of these was John Lord Lovelace, distinguished by his taste, by his magnificence, and by the audacious and intemperate vehemence of his Whiggism. He had been five or six times arrested for political offences. The last crime laid to his charge was that he had contemptuously denied the validity of a warrant signed by a Roman Catholic Justice of the Peace. He had been brought before the Privy Council and strictly examined, but to little purpose. He resolutely refused to criminate himself, and the evidence against him was insufficient. He was dismissed, but before he retired, James exclaimed in great heat, "'My lord, this is not the first trick you have played on me.' "'Sir,' answered Lovelace, with undaunted spirit, "'I never played any trick to your Majesty, or to any other person. Whoever has accused me to your Majesty of playing tricks is a liar.' Lovelace had subsequently been admitted into the confidence of those who planned the revolution. His mansion, built by his ancestors out of the spoils of Spanish galleons from the Indies, rose on the ruins of a house of Our Lady in that beautiful valley through which the Thames, not yet defiled by the precincts of a great capital, nor rising and falling with the flow and ebb of the sea, rolls under woods of beech around the gentle hills of Berkshire. Beneath the stately saloon, adorned by Italian pencils, was a subterraneous vault in which the bones of ancient monks had sometimes been found. 
In this dark chamber some zealous and daring opponents of the government held many midnight conferences during that anxious time when England was impatiently expecting the Protestant wind. The season for action had now arrived. Lovelace, with seventy followers, well armed and mounted, quitted his dwelling and directed his course westward. He reached Gloucestershire without difficulty, but Beaufort, who governed that county, was exerting all his great authority and influence in support of the Crown. The militia had been called out. A strong party had been posted at Cirencester. When Lovelace arrived there, he was informed that he could not be suffered to pass. It was necessary for him either to relinquish his undertaking, or to fight his way through. He resolved to force a passage, and his friends and tenants stood gallantly by him. A sharp conflict took place. The militia lost an officer and six or seven men, but at length the followers of Lovelace were overpowered. He was made a prisoner, and sent to Gloucester Castle. Others were more fortunate. On the same day in which the skirmish took place at Cirencester, Richard Savage, Lord Colchester, son and heir of the Earl Rivers, and father by a lawless amour of that unhappy poet whose misdeeds and misfortunes form one of the darkest portions of literary history, came with between sixty and seventy horse to Exeter. With him arrived the bold and turbulent Thomas Wharton. A few hours later came Edward Russell, son of the Earl of Bedford, and brother of the virtuous nobleman whose blood had been shed on the scaffold. Another arrival, still more important, was speedily announced. Colchester, Wharton, and Russell belonged to that party which had been constantly opposed to the court. James Barty, Earl of Abingdon, had, on the contrary, been regarded as a supporter of arbitrary government. He had been true to James in the days of the Exclusion Bill. He had, as Lord Lieutenant of Oxfordshire, acted with vigour and severity against the adherents of Monmouth, and had lighted bonfires to celebrate the defeat of Argyle, but dread of popery had driven him into opposition and rebellion. He was the first peer of the realm who made his appearance at the quarters of the Prince of Orange. End of Part 15